Hello, my name is Andrew, and you're listening to Working for the Word, where I try to give you an insider look on what goes on in the world of Bible translation. So today we're continuing our series on this oral scripture adaptation experiment. And in this part, I want to begin by reviewing what we're talking about when we speak of oral Bible translation, or OBT, as some people say. Now, one of the advantages of translating the Bible directly to a recording, an oral-based translation, is that you don't have to teach people to read before they can get access to the scriptures. And this is a huge barrier. So if we look at oral Bible translation, one of the motivations is to take away barriers between people and the Word of God. So imagine you're starting out with a new language that's never been written before. Well, if you do a written translation, first you have to develop an orthography. And that can take years because you have to get the whole community involved to decide, okay, are we going to write these letters or this, use different letters than we're used to seeing in the trade language or whatever? Uh, which letters are we going to use or are we not going to use? Uh, how are we going to mark tone if we have tone in our language? And all of that kind of stuff can eat up years of your life trying to figure that out just to be able to start writing down the translation. And then once you've written it down, you are faced with a whole population that's not used to reading their own language or doesn't even know how at all. So think about how long does it take a typical person to learn how to read proficiently in their own language. But let's imagine that these people already know how to read a trade language and so the bridge to getting to their the reading of their own language is easier, right? But it still takes time and there's still this hesitancy with a lot of people. There's still this barrier, a psychological barrier or just laziness, you name it. It's a barrier. So you have the barrier of, of developing an orthography, which is a lot of time that keeps people from having the scriptures sooner. And then you have the barrier of reading. So then, let's say nobody wants to read your translation. Nobody wants to take the time. I mean, in the States, you think about who wants to read books anymore? Nobody wants to read books. That's why Audible is killing it. They're making millions because people are too lazy nowadays to actually read or they're too busy, so they have to have something on the go. And and the effect of social media and all of those things is just keeping people more and more from reading texts. Well, this is happening all over the world. It's not a very interesting thing to give people a written text anymore like it was a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago, if you gave someone a written text, it was like giving them, handing them a cell phone. It was like handing them a TV. It was amazing. That was the way of entertainment back then. That was the, the main form. That was the main form of mass communication. I was actually watching a movie recently, black and white movie, from before they had cell phones. And and it's interesting seeing what people would do while they were standing around waiting. So this movie is Shop Around the Corner with Jimmy Stewart. And he works at this shop where they're, the employees are waiting for the owner to get there and open up the store so they can get to work. So what do they do while they're sitting around? Well, nowadays, you look at your phone. Back then, he had uh, Jimmy Stewart had a newspaper, and then the girl next to him had a book. And that's how they stood around waiting for things to happen. That has sadly gone the way of the dinosaur in most of the world. Now, if you think about a developing country, a country where they have not had centuries and centuries of tradition of writing and reading, where that that foundation is not strong and embedded and ingrained in their culture, imagine how much more difficult it is to get those kinds of people to read in the modern age when they have TVs and when they have smartphones. So this is what we're up against now in translation, in giving people written texts 
those written texts, even if they're perfect translations, even if they're amazing, even if they're clear and natural and accurate, people are just not going to read them because they don't like reading. And we can't criticize them because our own Western nations are headed the same direction faster than a freight train. So this is precisely why I wanted to do oral translation because if you take an oral culture, the best way to get people to engage with the scriptures is to make the jump directly into oral translation. That way you skip all of these barriers and people can listen on their cell phones immediately when the translation is done. They don't have to learn to read. And it's hard to teach, especially the older generation that really appreciates their language, it's harder to teach them to read because in Equatorial Guinea, those are usually the people who have the least education, who have the most barriers to being able to read, and probably their eyesight isn't very good either, and they don't have money to afford glasses. So how are you going to get the scriptures to these people? And the answer is, let them listen to it. Let them listen to it. You know, maybe they don't have money for their own device to listen on. Maybe they don't have reliable electricity in their village. But they always find a way to listen to something that's valuable. So this is the beauty of oral Bible translation and the strategicness of it that made me super interested in experimenting with this as a way to reach the Fong people with the scriptures. So all that by way of introduction, now let's continue on with the story where we left off. The logistics of recording the music that we put in these recordings was often very difficult. The musical director and composer, Kanuto Ngi, lived in the city of Malabo which is on the island of Bioko. So Equatorial Guinea is extremely dysfunctional in this sense because they decided to put their capital city on an island that is actually closer to Cameroon than it is to the mainland of Equatorial Guinea, which is just insane. Um, And they don't have regular boats that go there either. So people have to fly back and forth, which most people will never, ever get on a plane in their life because it's so expensive and local flights there are often as expensive as it would be to fly from New York to LA in the States. So that's not helpful. (laughs) And uh, so he was there, we were on the mainland, and he was only able to participate on site during four separate week-long visits. And he had a family and all of that. So what he would do is he would bring his xylophone with him and we would put him up at our house and give him time and space to compose new songs right then. So it was kind of like a retreat for him to come up with new music. And then we would record the songs right there and the background music during these intensive weeks. And often we would leave a song kind of in a draft form waiting for us to find the right vocal singer to add those vocals later. Now, the let's talk about these instruments, the typical traditional instruments for the Fong people. The menjang, or the xylophone, was the principal instrument for the background music. Other instruments included two sizes of these horizontal hollowed out log drums that are, it's called the ngu, and um, also a tall vertical drum with a canvas head, which they call mbing, and a small gourd maraca called nyas, and bamboo sticks called bikwara, and then finally the nvet which we already described and linked to in earlier show notes. And then also a glass bottle and uh, a sitatunga antelope horn called entofik. Now the instrument that was most difficult for us to find was actually the instrument that's the most crucial to this whole ordeal, which is the invet, which is that uh, crazy looking fang guitar kind of thing. The thing is that it's now so scarce in the country that it took us several months 
of asking everyone we knew if they knew anybody who had one if they knew who could make one if they knew anything that could help us but no no luck at all uh, so for the first few recordings uh, we just did it with the xylophone and that actually was innovative it forced us to be innovative and it got people's attention because they had never heard the xylophone used in that way and it was very really interesting to them finally we found somebody on the island of Bioko who knew how to make them he was a younger guy who was interested in the art form and so we commissioned one to be made and that sound was added to the instrumentation for the later recordings in classic in Verjung, this epic style of narration all narration has a bell rhythm in the background and that is to be repeated tirelessly for hours personally honestly I hated this thing I hated it but they told me everyone told me you cannot have anything to do with in Verjung without the bottle uh, over and over just <laughs> it was cr it, it, it was a very piercing sound and and often just drove me crazy but I knew that no one would listen to our recordings if it wasn't in there so we had to go with it so earlier I said bell rhythm but this was actually approximated by striking a glass bottle like an empty big whiskey bottle with the hard end of a xylophone mallet since we weren't able to find a traditional iron bell called angong. So this thing is layered with all of the other instruments and the rhythms are highly repetitive but with many layers of complexity from from everything else. Some compositions such as the song of Miriam involved a principal voice and choruses with a call and response pattern. Finding skilled singers and chorus members with natural Fong accents who could sing the traditional melodic style and tune turned out to be one of the most difficult tasks of the project, actually. We relied entirely on volunteers from local churches and learned by experience to ask for an audition before inviting someone to record because there were a lot of people that people thought were good singers and that just wasn't the case at all. When we found a skilled volunteer to sing the main part on a song, we gave them a draft recording of the composer singing the melody with the background instrument so they could learn and practice before coming to record. And that way we cut down a lot of retakes in the studio. And we learned that the hard way. All instruments and voices were recorded with an H2 Zoom serving as a mic connected to this old Dell laptop I had running Windows XP. Uh, the digital audio workstation or DAW that I used was Acid Pro 4 by Sony. Why I used such ancient equipment is a story for another day, but I had very good reason for doing so. <laughs> so I think at this point it would be good to play a sample of one of these songs. So here we go. Here's another sample. Now the song that you're about to hear is called The Morning of Naomi, which is her expression of grief in the Book of Ruth. <laughs> Now let's talk about another element of these recordings that we put a whole lot of work into. And these were these sermons at the end of the recordings. Because a brief lesson drawn from the story is common in Fang folk tales, though not necessarily in Mviroyang, 
And because Acasio strongly desired to do so, each recording concluded with a brief sermon. Now, by preference of the translator, these sermons were written by me in Spanish and translated orally into Fang with some contextual adjustments by him. And they drew out the points from the text that were most relevant to current cultural issues and tied the story into the meta narrative of the Old Testament, Christ, and the Gospel. So here's a, a little sample for you. It's a part of a sermon that follows the story of Micah and the Levite in the book of Judges. So here we go. Brothers, we have heard the story of our God. Now, what can we learn from the third part of this book of Judges? From beginning to end, it is about the madness of idolatry. The problem with Micah, his mother, and the others is that they are ignorant. They have no idea that their actions and beliefs are absurd and contradict each other. Micah, whose name means who is like Yahweh, makes an altar for other gods. And then he thinks that Yahweh will bless him for having a Levite as his priest. In other words, this story shows us what serious stupidity can result when a generation does religious things without knowing what will really please God. Are you doing the same? With Micah and the Levite, we see that Israel has combined the religion of Canaan with the true worship of Yahweh. Have we done the same in Equatorial Guinea? Yes, we have treated God as someone to manipulate to get the good life. We have used the name of God for our own gain. We have combined the lies of witchcraft and idolatry with the truths of Yahweh, and that has produced a poison that is killing us. We see that Israel had spiritual HIV, and Equatorial Guinea has nothing less. Confusion and ignorance amid the churches of the world is growing every day. Why? Because each one seeks his own gain and does not seek to know the word of God or an intimate relationship with God, nor delight in him. The role Yahweh gave the Levites in Numbers 18.2 was to serve in the house of God as the priests. They were men dedicated to the service of Yahweh. But in this story of Micah, we see that they are taking advantage of their positions to gain something. They are willing to do anything, anything evil, even worship idols to earn money. Isn't that our country right now? There are shop churches everywhere. There are so many who call themselves men of God, but they are equal to the Levite in this story. We do not know the true God or his word, but we know how to shout and do other things that give the appearance of a religious service. Many of them are throwing spiritual fire, quote-unquote fire, at their enemies, even though Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. By their ignorance, they are walking the road to hell and leading many to the same. In Equatorial Guinea, we are seeing religious leaders like Micah, who are just as we see in the book of Jude which says these men speak of spiritual things that they do not understand. They act like animals without understanding and use spiritual things for their own condemnation and all that for making money. They are an embarrassment. They are shepherds who care only for themselves. They are clouds without water carried by the wind. They are trees that do not bear fruit in their time, twice dead and uprooted. They are stars that have lost their way and are doomed to spend eternity in the darkest darkness. They complain about everything, criticize everything, and only seek to satisfy their own desires. They talk boastfully and flatter others to take advantage of them. So that's just a little snippet of an example of a sermon that we recorded after these long portions of Scripture. And it helped people connect and apply these things to their life and to the rest of the Bible. Now let's talk about mixing and sound effects. So as I mentioned earlier, I was using a DAW to edit everything into a final product. 
So I was putting the narration, the background music, the songs, the sound effects, and final sermon, and combining them all into one file. During this process, uh, we worked through the narration together. So I would work with the translator, Acasio, and we would insert the songs at the right place, uh, the refrains, the background music, and sound effects in all the right places. And he would make sure that they were exactly how he wanted them. And this also served as a final chance to catch and correct mistakes or improve the adaptation. The additional sound effects is a modern variation on the traditional Mverian, obviously, right? In which the storytellers, they made rich use of idiophones, words that evoke an idea through their sound, similar to onomatopoeia. But naturally, these troubadours didn't have a full range of sound effects at their disposal. Well, let's talk about these these idiophones that they have in Fang. It, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing how many idiophones they have. And this is something unique. And in their dictionary, somebody compiled a dictionary a while back, and they have a whole section in the dictionary dedicated to idiophones, their, their own category. And so often, you know, you'd have it, uh, the, the sound that they make, and they might have several for somebody dying or some, the sound of killing somebody. And it's, it's a word, it's a word, but it's, it's, not, it's not just a sound effect either. It's, that's why we call them idiophones in linguistics. But what we wanted to do was enhance all of this and make it sound like you were listening to a movie soundtrack with the music and all these cool sound effects. So I got these from a couple sources. I downloaded a lot for free online. And then I recorded some sound effects that were customized with Fong volunteers. Examples of these sound effects range from medieval warfare sound effects to animal noises, baby cries, wind, fire, water, etc. There's a lot of warfare because we recorded Joshua and Judges and First Samuel, so you can hear a lot of battle sounds, sword fighting, horses galloping, people yelling indistinctly, all of that kind of thing. But it really produces an immersive experience for the listener. Kind of like Adventure, Adventures in Odyssey. I don't know if any of you grew up listening to that like I did, but that was huge for me. I love how professionally they do that and how it can fire your imagination to feel like you're actually there in the moment with those people and with that story. And I wanted to create the same thing for the Fong people to experience and hopefully make it more attractive to people as a product for them to listen to and be changed and transformed by the Word of God. So let's go ahead and listen to some passages where this happens, shall we? So let's start with the soundscape of slavery. This soundscape follows Exodus 1, 13 and 14, which says, So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. So part of what you're going to hear at the tail end of this is the sound of a group of people singing a song to help them keep the rhythm of pulling a large object. They're kind of it sounds like they're dragging a large stone or a large trunk of some kind. So keep that in mind. This is actually a traditional old way that some of the Fang people would work when they were pulling extremely large tree trunks together with a bunch of men. They would sing this song to help them focus on getting the rhythm and pulling and resting and all of that. Now, if you pay attention to the very first part, you're going to hear some idiophones from the translator, biot, 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 which communicates the sound of stomping to make mud bricks, mixing it with your feet. Here we go. Biot, 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 biot. Kasim, you see? 
piot 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 now if you notice in the soundscape there wasn't the background rhythm and the bottle sound and all of that and we did that intentionally so that every time there was a pause in all of that the listener knew that this is no longer scripture being translated this is just a soundscape sort of like a a footnote or a study bible note so you get the idea there so for the sounds of group voices how did we do that uh, we would invite like six to fifteen people and we would describe the situation to them and record them imaginatively performing the scenarios in Fong and this way we got sound clips of Fong voices as the Israelites suffering under hard labor as in this one the Egyptians bemoaning the plagues for example uh, the jealous mutterings of Joseph's brothers the fear of the sailors on Jonah's ship the repentance of the Ninevites and lots of others so this added many extra contextualized elements to the recordings we even incorporated a traditional victory chant or cry after Yahweh's victory over Pharaoh's chariots and also another common thing that we have everywhere throughout the recordings is the the fang exclamation of surprise and shock which is akie akie or kie so that adds a really nice flavor to everything uh, for the sounds of a larger crowd such as the war cries of the Israelites at Jericho we took advantage of a promotional visit to a large urban church to ask those Fong speakers who were willing to stay afterwards and help us record a few shouts so all these elements uh, I blended together to create vivid soundscapes accompanying these key scenes like you heard uh, for example the Exodus story you know we have the soundscape of the roar of the sea crashing back on the Egyptian chariots and their drivers crying out in fear and then becoming gradually muffled under under the deluge of of water and uh, finally drowning and silence uh, so after a sobering watery lull then the narration picks back up and so this we hope added more interest for a modern listener making it more like like I said listening to a movie so let's listen to that clip of the Egyptians being destroyed <laughs> By the way, if you haven't been listening with earphones, I highly recommend that or some good speakers to really get the full effect of all the detailed editing work that went into this. So 
Let's listen to another clip, this time of the destruction of Jericho. Now, if you want to follow along in your Bible, you can look up Joshua 6.20. That's where it's going to start, and it's going to go through the destruction. They set everything on fire. And then at the end, you're going to hear the victory shout or chant, the traditional Fung victory shout when they've won a battle. <laughs> Now, if you heard in the background, there were some battle drums, and we had developed those to always go in the background when they were getting ready to go to war or in the middle of a battle to have that in the background. And it was all original, done by the, the musician, Ganuto. And they turned out really, really cool. And so I was I was especially pleased with how those battle drums uh, came together. So Now before we wrap this up, let's go ahead and listen to some of the plagues of Egypt. These soundscapes were especially fun to record, and I'll link in the show notes a video so you can see us recording some of those in Equatorial Guinea on site. Um, first I'm going to play the locusts, and then the flies, and then the plague of frogs, and then the plague of death. And so these are all pauses in the narration where you can imagine as the listener the these plagues coming upon the Egyptians, then their response, their cries, and uh, like with the flies, you can hear them slapping themselves, slapping at these flies and everything. And uh, then as, as we get to the plague of death, uh, the death of the firstborn, you hear... It's like you're cycling through different scenes of different households, different people crying out the death of a loved one. And uh, so check these out, and then we'll wrap this up. Now, one of the coolest things about these clips, before I play them, is that through them we were able to introduce the listener to the idea of how each plague was going against a certain god that the Egyptians worshipped. So they had their whole pantheon of gods, each god responsible for different parts of creation. And so Yahweh was actually targeting with each plague a different god, you know, the god of the of fertility, for example, or a, a god of the that controls the weather, these different things. And so when when you hear these interludes, the way we did this was you have the people responding to the plague and then you have somebody calling out to the priest, or in this case, the, the sorcerer, the local sorcerer, and asking, what, what, what do we have? What, what news do we have from the god who, you know, and then they name the, the specific god that has to do with that plague. And, and then the, the sorcerer says, we've got nothing basically, and everybody's like, what? And then they cry out more. So it's a really neat way to make an oral adaptation into a study Bible of sorts that's seamlessly integrated into the whole narration and enhances the person's understanding of the ancient Near East and the context, the original context. So here we go. <laughs> 
So now you have an idea of what it sounds like to mourn in the Fong culture. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with others who might find it interesting and edifying. And if you would, please leave a review. That's a really great way to help keep the podcast going. Here at Working for the Word, we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book sweeter than honey, and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists ultimately to help you treasure the Bible, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1, 